Thank you, Pastor Brian. Thank you for coming tonight on this evening. In Psalm 122.1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord on a Sunday night. So we appreciate you coming back. We trust you uh, had a, a, great, a great rest and that uh, you realize that uh, Sundays are for a, a day of rest. And So praise the Lord for you. We had a wonderful afternoon. It's such a blessing, a delight to be in the Weta house. And we, we did have another great offer for housing as well, but... Uh, there is something about that upstairs there. I don't know if you've ever been to the Wheatus house. Uh, so, all right. Well, we're all going there after the service tonight. No, not really. We almost did that. almost did that. Wow. But if you've ever been upstairs, you know, it's three bedrooms, two bath, living room, everything upstairs. It's just like we have our own house up there. It's very private and very nice. And, and what we do is we just sleep a couple hours in this bed and then that bed and then that bed. I, <laughs> I hope you don't mind that. Uh, the last people that stayed here did the same thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, we are enjoying that and appreciate you. And we had a wonderful time at the Morgans this afternoon as we continued our traditional brat fest there. And so uh, I appreciate all of you. You're all special to us. We appreciate, again, your prayers and your financial support that enable us to continue going to smaller churches and, of course, overseas. And just pray that we'll get back to that. Again, June is supposed to be England and then Peru, South America for, for July and August, and then Brazil, August and September. And then we have a full, full fall schedule here in the States for the rest of September, October, November. And so be praying for us. Go to our website if you've never been there, evangelistrandyshovan.org, and, and we have lots of things on there for you to look at, our latest prayer letters there, even some pics if that doesn't scare you away, but we have a, a button there for the schedule, and you hit that button and find out where we are that week and pray for us. We would sure appreciate that. We need lots of prayer, especially in these days of my wife's medical condition, and we pray that that's going to be rectified and that we can get on our way. And so praise the Lord for you, and we're going to have a wonderful service tonight as we continue in Micah chapter 6. If you haven't found Micah 6, perhaps you want to get there while my wife comes and shares with you another in her repertoire of sacred recitation. I love these recitations. I hope you love them. And I'm so used to having one before I preach. And when I have to travel alone, it's, it's so strange to get right up and preach without a recitation. But because she's a, a great trooper. Uh, not many people could do what she does. And these 26 years now traveling, and then all those years pastoring as well. So let's listen, prepare our hearts. Pastor opted against the second verse on Speak, O Lord. And I said, oh, in light of what my husband uh, is preaching tonight and things in my own heart and mind, teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility, Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise. Cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail. Let their truth prevail over unbelief. There is a place that I can go and do the things that none will know and steal the sweet forbidden fruit and feel that none will find. It is the secret chamber of my mind. And in this secret room, I can recall the evil deeds I've done, both great and small, and with great pleasure make them live again and taste once more the sweet reward of sin there in the secret chamber, deep within. And in this secret room, I can no doubt pursue the evil deeds I wish to carry out, but fear what other folks would think to find me doing things I'd thought of in my mind, in the secret chamber of my mind. 
outside, I bow to God. And others see the things I say and do and seem to be and think me fine and noble, kind and good. But within, some other gods I find. Within, I bow to lust and greed and pride and things that I would never let outside my secret chamber, for you see, the watching world would know my darker side, that in my chamber I can hide. Then upon my chamber wall I saw an eye. I never noticed it before. I wonder why. It sees all the evil that I try to hide. And to my utter horror, I did find God looking on the chamber of my mind. I trembled as I thought what that would mean. I'd been so careful. I thought no one had seen the sins with which I loved to spend my time. But God saw them in the chamber of my mind, the secret, private chamber of my mind. Proverbs 27, 3, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The heart and the mind are connected in that verse, and that is a great reminder of the battles we face in our mind. That's why the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Being sober has means having your mind under the right influence. And so casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and disciplining our minds and talking away loose, dangling thoughts as Peter enjoined in 1 Peter 1.13, gird up the loins of your mind. And so, Father, we thank you for that recitation. My, we could give an invitation after that one. <laughs> And Lord, I, I reckon that most of us battle with thoughts, thoughts that may be unholy or immoral or anger or worry or fear and, and a host of other things that, if we're not careful, can really kind of take over our mind and heart and our actions. And Lord, I pray that you bless all of us in this area of mercy and forgiveness and humility as Micah shares that with us tonight. And from your word in, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And so, Lord, may the messages of the day, again, remind us. And that's what Peter said, that it's not that you don't know these things, but the fact that you do know them, but need to be reminded of them. And much preaching is reminding us of areas we really need to know about, and that's why you tell us this, this is the way, walk ye in it. And Father, we confess that most of us know that this is the way, but it's another thing to walk in it. So Lord, help us. We need your grace and your enablement every day of our lives. We thank you for the wonderful life in Christ you've given. Oh Lord, we wouldn't trade it for anything this world offers. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Lord, that we can preach and preach freely in this nation. And I pray for any spiritual needs that may be here tonight, especially if there's anyone that has come into our midst that not, has not yet received Christ as Savior and Lord and been born again. And I pray that tonight might be their night. I pray, Lord, for believers. We need strengthening. We need encouraging and maybe even rebuking and, and, and some reproof and, and some instruction in righteousness that we can go forward with a heart and life that, that loves you and that is acceptable to you. Bless us now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? All right, good. Hey, man, we're in Micah chapter 6. The first five verses we notice in, in this morning in the Sunday school hour, God reports the controversy. And God uh, shares with Israel that he's not accepting their worship and he's pleading with them and, and they are 
offering suggestions about what true worship is in verses 6 and 7. And they give some examples which show their absolute ignorance of the character of God and the scriptures of God concerning worship. So in verse 8, Micah remedies the controversy. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. Why are you offering these suggestions for worship when they're not even scriptural and they're downright wrong? He has showed thee, O man, what is good. Previous scriptures. And what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Now again, uh, Micah is written to the Jewish people under the law, but certainly there are principles here for every born-again, blood-bought, heaven-bound child of God. Why do I pick on you? I don't know. <laughs> I know. But I like front row people, because that's where all the spit and blessings are. Yes. So if a few come your way, sister, just enjoy it. All right, so, and so we as believers in the New Testament era under the New Covenant, we need these principles, and we need to be reminded of them because many people have a false concept of worship or their worship is not based on knowledge and understanding of God's Word. And we learned this morning that worship goes far beyond Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, or a Wednesday night church experience. That worship is a way of life. Worship is a lifestyle, and we need to understand that. You know, the old English word for worship is worth. Did you see my mouth? Worthship. That's the old English word, worthship. Ascribing worth and value to the God of heaven. Having God at the top, the very tippy top of our value system. And we say as the as John in, in Revelation, in Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And so the way we live and think and behave is to be a worthiness of God in our lives. You know why you're here tonight? Because God is worthy of it. God is worthy of any expense, of any inconvenience, any amount of gas, a lot of those these days. God is worthy of anything that it might cost you to honor Him and worship Him and praise Him. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's the top of our value system. And flowing out of our value system are our priorities. <laughs> Why is it, some, it's not a priority to come back to the Sunday night service because it's never been part of their value system. I know there are legitimate concerns. I talked to Richard today, and he's definitely got a cough and a cold and doesn't want to share with others, and he's got dentures that he says he hates. (laughs) I've never had dentures, so I don't know. But if he hates them, well, power to him. but, But, you know, some have legitimate reasons, but how many could be here tonight if they chose to be? See, that's the thing. you got to ascribe that kind of worth and value to the God of heaven. That's part of worthship. (laughs) Ascribing value, worth to God. And so we're learning here that worship is a lifestyle that goes far beyond religious enterprise, although what we do here in the local church can and certainly is worship. But you can't just have the outwards. That was Israel's problem. They had no problem keeping the feast days and the animal sacrifices, but it wasn't with a proper heart. And they were violating other principles of Scripture that, that hindered their worship. As we learned this morning concerning to do justly, to be, be, be. God doesn't want you to do more. He wants you to be more because if you'll be what you ought to be, you'll do what you ought to do. <laughs> And so be righteous. That was where we left off at the morning service concerning our responsibility of being righteous and just and honest and full of integrity in every relationship with our fellow man because these first two, to do justly and to love mercy, deal with our interpersonal relationships. So two-thirds of your worship is determined by how you treat other people. You don't, other, you don't treat other people in a biblical way and an, an understanding how we're supposed to treat other people. Your worship is hindered. And so we realize we can sing hymns and put money in a plate and come to a church service and hear preaching and go home and say we've worshipped. But if we're in violation, 
then our worship is hindered. We'll learn that again tonight as we go now to the second part of worship. So you have the horizontal relationships to do justly and to love mercy, and then we have the vertical relationship is walking humbly with thy God, and these work together in a perfect 90-degree angle. Be blessed, be blessed. And so, uh, so we get the second part of our horizontal and then we'll go to the vertical, which is to walk humbly with thy God. And so what does it mean then to love mercy? Do you love being merciful? Do you love to forgive others who have wronged you? Well, to be honest, in the flesh we don't enjoy being offended. We don't find it in our flesh oftentimes to be forgiving and merciful to others who wrong us. In the flesh, we can harbor bitterness. In our flesh, we can harbor an unforgiving spirit. But when you do that, you're violating the scripture. And so let's learn together what it means then to love mercy. As it was with doing justly or being righteous, you cannot fulfill that or accomplish that if you're not saved. You have to receive the imputed righteousness of Christ and have that working in you as the Spirit of God now produces works and worship through your life that is acceptable and is pleasing to the Lord. Don't forget Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I don't care how religious they are. I don't care what levels of morality they may achieve. If you have, this, if you have the heart you were born with, God cannot receive anything out of the heart you were born with because that's a sinful, depraved, corrupt heart that cannot produce anything that God would be pleased with. And so we need the new birth. We need to be saved, and then we can be righteous. The same with forgiveness. If you have never received the forgiveness of God, then you do not understand how to forgive others. Unless you received the mercy of God, you cannot be merciful to someone else. And so we cannot forgive properly until we have received the forgiveness of God. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Even in Old Testament, Isaiah, I love Isaiah chapter 12. You got this psalm right in the, in the, in the midst of Isaiah's prophecies. And it said, I will, I, will pray, I will praise the Lord, for though he was angry with me, his anger is turned away and he has comforted me. It's a wonderful thing to know that although before we were saved, our sins came up as a stench in the nostrils of a holy God, our sins provoked him to anger. I will praise him because although he was angry with me, his anger is turned away. The moment you call on Jesus Christ to save your poor, wretched, hell-bound soul, the anger of God is turned away. And he now comforts you. And he says in Isaiah 12 too, Behold, God is my salvation. Not me, not a church. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. What a wonderful truth in the Old Testament about what we're enjoying even today in the New Covenant. And so the forgiveness. The forgiveness of God, the Lord Jesus gave us this mandate to help others to come to the forgiveness of God. In Acts 26, 18, we are to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance that is in me. And so the forgiveness of sins, what a wonderful, wonderful, blessed truth. What a wonderful, wonderful availability that any one of us can experience the amazing forgiveness of the Lord, whether you need to be forgiven initially in a salvation, born-again experience, or as believers, we have the wonderful promises of God of His forgiveness to restore fellowship. Our relationship with God is never broken but fellowship with God can be broken and needs to be restored through confession and forgiveness. And once we know this wonderful forgiveness of God, then we should know how to forgive others. Because the standard of our forgiveness 
is Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. When I was pastor of First Baptist Church in Pasco, Washington for many years back in the 90s and early 2000s, we became pastor of that church and inherited a ladies group that was meeting for many years on Tuesday mornings. Well, my wife eventually became the leader of that group, and they didn't have a name, so I gave them a name. The Bicota Ladies. Bicota. It's the first six letters of the first six words of Ephesians 4.32. Be ye kind one to another. Bicota. So they became known forevermore as the Tuesday morning Bicota Ladies. And yes, we will receive the forgiveness of God. We now know how to forgive others because that's the standard. As God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, you are to forgive. But the problem is many of us still have some worldliness within us as far as this area of forgiving others. You know, Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove it is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And so this area of forgiving others and loving mercy, we many times resort to the world's standards of forgiveness. Let me give you some examples. The world says, I will forgive you when you right all the wrongs you committed against me. But what if they never do? They should. They should make right their offenses and, and wrongs against you, but what if they never do? Do I sit here harboring a spirit of unforgiveness waiting for them to make it right? How did God, for Christ's sake, forgive you? You know, there I was, a Roman Catholic boy for 20 years, had no clue what salvation was, what it meant to be born again, never read the Bible before in my life. You know I thought the last book of the Bible was called Concordance. You remember that. <laughs> but one of my drinking buddies got saved, Bo Nelson from Waco, Texas, and begged me to come and watch his believer's baptism on that Sunday night of September 19, 1976, and I made every excuse why I couldn't go. I had no dealings with God at that time in my life. Once I left home and got in the Air Force, I never went to Mass again, and I'm a worldling par excellence, <laughs> and I'm enjoying all of the pleasures of sin in this life, and now my drinking buddy, we used to get commode hugging drunk. <laughs> the, the, the club, the nightclub, is right across the street from our barracks. <laughs> How convenient. And night after night we were over there drinking up a storm and now my main drinking buddy gets saved. It's amazing how God works in his sovereignty in mysterious ways. But, and so he's going to follow the Lord and believers' baptism and invites me there. I go there for the first time in my life in a gospel-preaching, Bible-believing, heaven-loving, hell-hating, independent, fundamental Baptist church. Boy, was it different. Do you hear a word that preacher had to say? I didn't care what that preacher had to say. I was there to fulfill an obligation. My friend wants me to watch his baptism. That's after the preaching. So that preacher, Jim Kennard, is giving his message and pouring his heart into that thing, gives an invitation, and people were getting up and going forward for salvation. I said, I, I, these people must have some kind of a need. I was absolutely oblivious Ignorant that I had the same need they had. Well, I watched my friend get baptized, and that was fine for him. And this church ran about 700 in the morning. It's all military on, on Okinawa, Japan. 55,000 troops there in Okinawa when I was there. And so we had 700 in the morning and 500 at night. So Bo Nelson follows the Lord in believers' baptism and take, gets the right hand of fellowship. He came into the church, and 500 people want to shake his hand and congratulate him. I'm saying, how long is this going to take? Are you saying that about the message right now? <laughs> how long is this going to take? <laughs> so I, I'm waiting for my ride home, and some of you have heard this testimony. I'm in the foyer area, and a guy, a Navy guy, Mark Cheney, comes up and shares the gospel with me, and, and, and he shares the 
greatness of the salvation of God and takes me through the understanding that I'm a sinner that could never save my own soul by religious or moral means. Because of my sin, I deserve death and hell. But Jesus Christ, God incarnate, died in my place and poured out his life's blood and paying the penalty of my sin and rose again from the dead and is alive forevermore, offering freely by his grace the gift of eternal life. He said, would you like to be saved tonight? And I said, yes, I would. And at that point... Mark Cheney takes a big, long scroll of paper and says, take out a ballpoint pen and you write down every offense you've ever committed against God and you go make right every one of those and then God will forgive you. Uh, is that how it happened with you? <laughs> did you right all of the wrongs against God the day you got saved? Or did you confess your sinfulness <laughs> and sought to be forgiven? And brought into a right relationship with God through justification and reconciliation. So how did God, for Christ's sake, forgive you? Did he make you right all the wrongs before he forgave you? What about the Lord Jesus on the cross in Luke 23, 34? As he looks at his tormentors, he looks at those who nailed him to a cross. The Jews, the Romans. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the great heart of God and his forgiveness to those who have wronged him. And we have that great heart of God. The very God of heaven, the God who died and rose again, now lives in us as born-again believers. And so we want to forgive, to love mercy, to forgive as God, for Christ's sake, forgave us. People need to make restitution or they need to get right, but if they never do, I have forgiven them. And if you don't, Hebrews 12, 15 says, If you do not forgive, a root of bitterness will trouble you and defile you. And I have dealt with believers who are absolutely eaten up with bitterness over somebody's offense. And they're defiled. They're almost useless to the Lord. They can't function properly, spiritually speaking, because of this great bitterness and unforgiving spirit. Now we're going to learn a little bit how we actually do that, how we forgive others who have wronged us, although they've not yet made it right. But the second way the world forgives is I will forgive, but I won't forget. I will forgive you, but I won't. Forget it, and what they do is they put that incident or that offense in a file drawer in their mind. And the next time they do that, you go running to the file drawer and you bring that out and say, That's just what you did the last time. Watch it in your marriage. You always do that. <laughs> Careful with those kind of statements. And marriages are seeming to be the, a great fostering of going to the file drawers, and bringing up the weaknesses and the failures and the offenses of a husband or wife. And it can be that with, with girl and children. It can be that with employers. It can be that with an ex, divorced, and ex, and a lot of bitterness and unforgiving spirits out there. And, of course, as a, for, I've been in full-time ministry 42 years, and I've dealt with so many people that have done marriage counseling and things that I and and a lot of counseling that it just I just never intended to do that much but there are those people who have those needs but dealing with somebody with a, a divorce and the, and, the, and the terrible terrible way they were treated before that divorce and 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 now bitter against an ex and and bitter against a former employer who 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 so wronged you on the job and and maybe fired you for no apparent reason or whatever it is and the bitterness can well up within you I will forgive you but I won't forget so how did God for Christ's sake forgive us <laughs> Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, why did he not say as far as the north is from the south? Because you can only go north so long, and north has a termination point. And what is that? The North Pole. 
Once you hit the North Pole, you start going south. And, and you can only go south so far because south has a termination point. And that is the... Thank you, brother. <laughs> and so north and south both have termination points. But how far east do you go before you hit west? How far west do you go before you hit east? There is no east pole. There is no west pole. If you're going west, you can go west forever. If you're going east, you can go east forever. How far has you removed your transgressions? Forever. Forever. You never have to fear that God's going to go up into the file drawers of heaven and bring out past charges against you. Who can bring anything against God's elect? Charges are gone. The books in heaven are erased. Revelation 12. Revelation 20, verse 12 and 13, those books in heaven, all of those charges against you that will be brought out against those who stand at the great white throne judgment, who died in their sins without a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, the books will be opened. And another book is opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Why does God write that down? Because he can't remember. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everybody's sins. No, they're brought out to... To prove that individual that they're worthy of judgment. As the books are all rehearsed and all of those entries in the books, those people realize they deserve. They deserve the judgment they're about to receive and going to the lake of fire. But praise God for the, those of us who have been forgiven. And we have been brought into a justified, reconciled relationship with the Lord. And all the books in heaven are gone against us. Gone, completely gone, never to be remembered again as Hebrews 10, 17. Your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's how God, for Christ's sake, forgave us. And that is how we're to forgive others. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love thinketh no evil. It has the idea of love keeps no record of wrongs. We don't keep records of wrongs to bring up. And so we forgive them and we never bring it up again nor tell someone else. Now here's where I'm being transparent. I have and I admit it. I've never brought it up to that individual again, but I sure told somebody else. Let me tell you what Pastor Weeda did to me. <laughs> Let me tell you what my ex did to me. Let me tell you what my employer did to me. Let me tell you what this one or that one did to me. And we somehow get some soulless or venting about what somebody did in offending us. I said I forgave them. And maybe I never brought it up to them again, but I'm sure telling somebody else. <laughs> That's not forgiveness. It's indicative that you've never truly forgiven them. And it's still something that eats at you in your heart. And so forgiveness. Sometimes we understand forgiveness by what forgiveness is not. I have here before me a page out of a book called Seven Keys to Spiritual Renewal by a man named Stephen Afterburner. No, Alterburner. <laughs> Arterburner. You know the guy? <laughs> Stephen Arterburn. Arterburn. Something about his arteries. But listen, I, I don't know this man, but I love what he wrote here. And I very rarely give you something that somebody else preached. I can't preach somebody else's message, brother. I don't know about you. I mean, others have, oh, that's a great, I hear people all that, man, I'm going to preach that again. This was just last week. There was a visiting pastor at our meetings in Bemidji. He says, man, I'm going to preach that to my people. Well, more power to you. I can't do that. I, I've got to have something born of God's spirit in me something where God has is, is convicted me and challenged me. And as I get most, in fact, all of my messages come out of my devotional life. As God deals with me in my own personal devotional life, man, man, that's just the Lord's dealing with me then. I tell him, you know what, that maybe somebody else needs this too. <laughs> but, but this is good. He says, number one, forgiveness is not condoning the behavior. Now understand that. When you forgive somebody, that's not saying, hey, what you did is all right. It's not all right. <laughs> We don't condone the offense. But we say the consequences of your behavior belong to God, not me. This can be liberating. This can be life-changing. When you realize that 
you're not their judge, and you realize that the consequences of their behavior, their behavior is sin. <laughs> and, and God needs to deal with that. And so we transfer that person from our own system of justice to God's. Can you remember that? Make a transfer. Say, well, right now they're, I want them to be under my justice system. So I'm going to be bitter and I'm going to be unforgiving and I'm going to speak evil of them. And, but now I place them under God's judgment. I forgive you. I don't condone your behavior, but I put your sin and offense now in God's court. And now it's up to God to deal with you. And I free myself of any unforgiveness or bitterness because I turn this over to the God of heaven and let him handle it. Number two, forgiveness is not restoring trust in the person. Nobody said that when you forgave them, you got to fully trust them again. If the guy's a thief, you certainly don't give him the keys to your car. <clears throat> He's no longer trustworthy of that. If the guy's a pedophile, you don't hire him to babysit your children. <laughs> Trust has to be earned. It has to be rebuilt. <laughs> Sometimes that takes a while to restore trust in somebody who has offended you. But you can forgive them. Turn them over to God's justice and say... I, I, I don't necessarily trust you, but I do forgive you. Forgiveness is not agreeing to reconcile. Some people get this mixed up, say, well, unless they're willing to reconcile with me, I can't forgive them. No, forgiveness is a necessary step toward reconciliation, but forgiveness can be done without reconciling. Reconciliation requires forgiveness, but forgiveness can be done without reconciling. If the other per what if the other person the other person is not willing to reconcile <laughs> due to bitterness or denial? And we can still forgive, and that certainly can be a first step toward reconciliation. And I like this last one: forgiveness is not easy because some people's offenses are very grievous, and it's one thing to forgive a one-time offense. But what if this is a reoccurring offense and sin towards you? That is really difficult. Verges on the impossible. But praise God, he can do the impossible. He can restore my soul, and he can give me the grace and the mercy to forgive someone else, even if the sin is reoccurring. And so such circumstances require an attitude of forgiveness. And so forgiveness is very important to the Lord. In fact, the Lord Jesus has some stern words about those who will not forgive. Let's listen to the words of our Savior in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and verse 24. Listen to our Savior. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar. All right, you're, you're attempting to worship God. Your gift to the altar, whether it's your gift of song or gift of money or gift of your presence here in the house of God. Therefore, if thy bring, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. You understand that? You're offering a gift to me, God says. You're trying to worship me, but there's unforgiveness and there's bitterness and there's offenses that you haven't dealt with. He said, leave the gift. Don't continue the worship because God's not receiving it. <laughs> leave that gift at the altar. Go make it right with thy brother and forgive him properly and biblically and then come back and offer your gift. The Lord also said in Matthew 6, 14, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I have dealt with many a believer. He said, I won't forgive them. I said, but the Lord Jesus said, if you don't forgive them, he's not going to forgive you. <laughs> so how important this is to the Lord. And as we think about 
I can sing the hymns, but money in the plate, and I can hear a message, and I can go home saying I've worshipped, but there's anyone you haven't properly forgiven. If there's anyone you're still bitter toward, someone that you're harboring an unforgiving spirit toward, God is not receiving your worship. Leave that worship, go make it right with them, and then come back and offer your worship. Is there anyone you can think of right now as the Spirit of God moves around this room? Is there anyone the Spirit of God is putting on your mind and heart right now? I said I forgave them. But you forgave them as the world forgives. You've not yet forgiven them as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And it may necessitate some of you going home and making a phone call or an email or a Facebook messenger or even a, an old letter <laughs> and say, you know what, I, I just want you to know I heard a message tonight. And I realize by the Spirit's help and by the Word of God that I've not forgiven you properly as God for Christ's sake has forgiven me. And I want you to know now I release that unforgiving spirit and bitterness and I forgive you. I forgive you. And what a peace and a joy will flood your soul as you finally let that thing go and forgive them as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And so these are our horizontal relationships. To do justly or be righteous, to love mercy or be merciful. And then we have our final ingredient of inner worship, which is to walk humbly with thy God. That's our vertical. And again, if you're having problems on the horizontal, it's because you're having problems in your vertical. If you're having problems in your vertical with your relationship or fellowship with the Lord, then you are going to have problems in your horizontal. You draw nigh to God, and then you'll draw nigh to who you're married to or whoever may be the person you're having trouble with. And so let's uh, think about what it means to walk humbly with thy God. When we think of pride, what does it mean to walk proudly before God? Pride is to walk in dependence upon self. Again, all three of these ingredients of internal worship are not possible without salvation, without being born again and having the Spirit of God come within you. Because before people are saved, they're very proud. And they can be proud of station and rank. They can be proud of their religious accolades. And their trust is in a religious system. And they do so well, dotting their I's and crossing their T's the way some church tells them to. And they're built up with religious pride. And they're built up with self-righteousness. They're not depending on the Lord Jesus and him alone for their salvation. Well, the cross is important, of course, but, but it's our works. It's our religion. It's what we do that... that, that adds to what Christ did on the cross, and that is absolute pride, and that is an insult to the God of heaven. You insult him when you add anything to what Christ did on that cross to save your soul. And so those who walk in pride have religious pride, and they have pride of their self-righteousness. There's no way then they could fulfill this worship or walk humbly with their God. They need to humble their hearts and that's what we do. When we hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus preached, we humble our hearts, we abandon self-righteousness, we abandon religiosity, and we come as humble sinners to the cross. And the bite the one who died and poured out his blood and then rose again off that cross out of the tomb, and we invite him into our hearts and lives to save us from our sins, no longer trusting in ourselves or walking in any kind of pride. But humility for the believer is to walk in dependence upon the Lord for everything. It is easy, even as a saved, born again, blood bought, heaven bound child of God, to begin to walk in pride. We can be proud of our spirituality. <laughs> and we can be proud in the sense that we depend upon ourselves. I can handle this. I don't need to go to God for this. I'll lean on my human reasoning. Uh, I will lean on common sense, and uh, I'll lean on what the world says is the solution to this problem. And I preached here messages on the life of Abraham long ago. You want to know when it was? Long ago. <laughs> and how Abraham had a wavering faith, and God was developing Abraham's faith. 
waiting and wavering, waiting and wavering as he waits for 25 years to get the promised son of covenant blessing in Isaac. And they go to the world for their solutions. Take Hagar, have children with her and Ishmael as the result, and the Arabs have been a thorn in Israel for the last 4,000 years. What a, what a travesty to go to the world. Egypt, Hagar, a handmaid of Egypt, going to the Egypt to solve your problems. Not walking humbly with thy God and seeking his face to handle these areas of difficulty I'm dealing with. And so we walk in humility. Isaiah certainly mentioned this in, in Isaiah. I have it memorized, but let me read it to you. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one. Have you ever addressed God like that in your prayer? <laughs> oh, Lord, I come to you as the high and lofty one. That inhabiteth eternity. God is totally outside the realm of time. He sees the end from the beginning. Whose name is holy. That's his name, holy. And God says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of of the contrite ones. So the Lord commends humility. And he loves to see you trust him. Every day, every experience, you're coming before him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy path. you realize that worships him? When you acknowledge him in every way? When you pray without ceasing and through the day you seek the face of your God for this decision or that one. I've got this problem. I come to the Lord. And when you walk in dependence upon him, he's glorified. He delights to see you trust in him to handle these problems, to walk humbly with thy God. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 5 Five, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth, this, giveth grace to the humble. That's how I can prove I'm humble. God gave grace to me. <laughs> humble yourselves. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That he may exalt you in due time. Be clothed with humility. Be clothed with that dependence upon the Lord God of heaven. Trust him for everything. Physical, monetary, spiritual, walk in dependence upon him. And as you do that, that comes up as worship before the Lord. It's not that I can sing of his love for No, it's walking in truth, walking in the spirit, walking in dependence upon the God of heaven. Because if you're going to walk in dependence upon yourself, you're walking in pride. Pride hinders your worship. And all that we do consider, con consider worship could be violated because we walk in self-dependence. We walk in self-indulgence. And we want to handle in an independent spirit from God all the things that come our way that are disturbing. Walking humbly with thy God is your vertical. Walking in trust and dependence upon him for all that you are and all that you need and all you have. And so... Micah remedies the controversy and says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And he's certainly shown us that today. He has shown us what is good and right in his sight to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. I don't know how God may have ministered to you today and tonight, but I trust he has because his word will never return void. <laughs> And so let's pray. Father in heaven, we rejoice to be here at Faith Baptist in Hermantown again. Oh, Lord, we've been here so many times, and it's such an honor for this pastor to keep inviting us. We look forward to our next meetings. And these people have endeared themselves to us through their prayers, their support, their love, their encouragement every time we come, and even 
before we come. But Lord, your word has gone forth again. And although we are great friends with these people, sometimes it's a friend that has to share something that is challenging and, and even sinful. Fathers, we seat, we're seated here before you. We know you're here and we acknowledge your presence. And Lord, there may be some here tonight who would have to say, I'm not sure I've ever received Jesus Christ as Savior. I've never received his spirit. And thus I'm still in the flesh and I've been trying to serve God and worship God in the flesh and the heart I was born with. And now I realize I must have a new birth where the Lord gives a new heart and places his spirit within us. And Lord, there may be somebody that's wrestling with loving mercy. And perhaps there's believers who struggle with wanting to control their own lives and not submitting to your authority in their lives. And they, they walk in pride and in self-assurance and self-determinations and self-indulgences. And as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, is there anyone here tonight? And you would say, I do need to go and make a phone call or a text message or something to somebody that I've not forgiven properly. And I believe God has spoken to my heart tonight that my worship may even be hindered because I'm harboring an unforgiving spirit or I'm bitter towards someone and God has convicted me and I am fully going to go through with this and contact that person and forgive them as God for Christ's sake has forgiven me if that is you and you'd like to lift a hand I'll pray for you that God will give you the courage and wisdom to do that anyone and then to do justly and to walk humbly with thy God and we all know that we could walk more in dependence upon the Lord God so father we want to worship you and we want to do it with the right spirit. And we want our externals and the things that we do here to be proper, but we realize that many times our internals are not correct and you want to lovingly plead with us, as you said in Micah 6, that we're your people and that you want us to worship you. You should be at the top of our value system as we ascribe worth and value to you to your word, to your church, to your people. So may our priorities reflect that you are at the top of our value system. So Lord, all of these things are important as we realize that worship is far more than just having a praise team or worship team or, or singing hymns. And, and Lord, we just pray that we would have a, a good understanding and a right perspective and that we would accomplish worshiping you and not be in violation. We thank you for what you do, what you're doing. What you will do, we commit it all to you in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to have a, pl a playing from Brother Vic. So let's stand to our feet, and let's just have our heads bowed and eyes closed as we stand to our feet as Vic plays. Pastor's here. I'm here. Of course, we always want to invite you to have the courage to step out if God is dealing with some area, especially if you need to be saved. And praise God. Last September, we were here at a, at a, a great salvation of a, a man and his wife was crying because she'd prayed for him so many years and and he just with great tears and great faith embraced the Savior perhaps tonight that needs to happen again with someone you'll never worship until you're saved till you're born again till you are converted it has nothing to do with religion it has everything to do with what Christ accomplished for you on the cross the work is completed the work is all done all you come now by faith and receive the work that Christ performed in your behalf to save your soul and to redeem you and purchase you to give you eternal life anyone like that we're here to encourage you to the Savior to be born again to be saved I'm an evangelist that's the first and foremost thing my heart is that you are rightly related to the God of heaven through the new birth if you're a believer and you're struggling in some of these areas that I preached this morning and tonight, would you seek the God of heaven to help you overcome these barriers and hindrances to your worship? 
So think about what we've heard today and meditate and evaluate and you and the Spirit of God get together and make sure these areas are corrected if they need to be. So Lord bless you all, Pastor. All right. You may be seated.